uh, we're live. My hair looks crazy, but we're live. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome again to Disrupt the Chaos. It's Tuesday, May 26. I'm excited about our guest tonight. Um, I want to, we just want to start with some news. You know, obviously, we're all watching news all the time, uh, the same amount of things are happening minute to minute. But um, the show is called disrupt the chaos which is what we're trying to do we're streaming on facebook instagram well not tonight not on instagram we're streaming on facebook youtube and periscope we hope to bring you the voices of organizers and artists and you know we try to inform people from a perspective of black and brown narratives of what's happening so i really thank everybody for joining and i hope you can share this and if anybody knows how we can eventually get this on instagram live without having to have another computer, let me know. We might not know that there's a way to do it. So again, thanks everybody for joining us. I, I wanted to start, I'm sure many people have seen the New York Times front page on Sunday where they printed almost all the names of people that have passed from COVID. And they're saying that by tonight or early tomorrow in the morning, over 100,000 people in the United States would have died of COVID-19, COVID-related diseases. Um, it's pretty small on the screen right now, but if you go to the New York Times, you can just see it. And um, what it what it's called is as U.S. U.S. deaths near 100,000. This is an incalculable loss. So it's a little small there, and then I have it here too. You know, obviously, to get that many names on in, on front of the page took a lot of work for the New York Times, and I think it's so important that we don't forget that there are people who are suffering, who are dying, and then there's families who are impacted by people who are dying, and there are family members, more than one or two or three, that are dying in just one family. So, you know, we really also urge everybody, especially our people, to wear masks, right? Like, and I think that's very hard to do in some of these cities where we also are, bodies are abused by police and, you know, wearing a hoodie gets you killed, well, now wearing a mask will get you killed, or if you're not wearing it right, are the police going to say you're not wearing it right? And it's, we're encountering a lot of police violence right now. Um, there's an, it seems to be an uptick again. But the epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic in the world is now Brazil. And it's really impacting and, and killing a lot of indigenous people that live in the Amazon uh, area or, or live in Amazonia area in Brazil. And Bolsonaro, who is the president of Brazil, they call him the Brazilian Donald Trump. And, you know, there are a lot of indigenous people, a lot of indigenous medicines. I mean, people have been impacted in the Amazonia river for so many years around logging and taking land. And now um, it's becoming the epicenter in the world. They they are digging 1,500 graves a day. And today there's over 8,000 people that have passed away in Brazil. And for those who've been to Brazil also understand the density of some areas in Brazil, like Sao Paulo, where the favelas are, and people are already living in very poverty uh, stricken conditions, but also the police brutality there is happening in the favelas uh, as well. So we need to you know, understand that this is a global pandemic and we need to be understanding what else is happening in the world and not just isolate ourselves or you know, make this 
world smaller than it seems right now and not talk about and not forget that this is a global pandemic. It is in every country and people are suffering. And many of the people suffering are suffering under presidents that act like the president here does, which is they do not care about people who are dying, unfortunately. So one story that did come out today and me and the producer of the show, Tandi, we decided we did not want to share this video because that's just something we're no longer comfortable with, with doing. In fact, I remember I was having a conversation um, a while ago with Jared Ball and, and he said it's almost catering um, like porn, like black murder uh, or black people being killed is something that people are being addicted to in a way. And I think he's absolutely right. But we do want to show the press conference in dealing with the, the brother that was killed by the police um, while people were watching. So we're going to show you the press conference. It's up to you if you want to go see this video. It is online, but I think it, it really sometimes hurts the psyche of us as a people to continually be traumatized by um, watching black men and brown men and women and children get killed. So do we have that, um, I'm sorry, do we have that video from the press conference? Well, as, as we wait for that, you know, I really want people to think about the people who actually witnessed this happening and who were yelling at the police and begging the police to stop. And I'm thinking about them right now as well, because they were traumatized, you know, they saw somebody killed right in front of their eyes. And I know they probably all wanted to somehow step in, but I, who, who would step in in that situation? You know, I think we all say we would, but we also know that if they did, a lot more people might have been dead, you know? So Dawn, thank you for that um, comment about we can share their lives um, then with their families, doing them, living their fullest lives. And that's what, you know, was choosing to share um, the picture and we'll wait for that press conference that just happened. Uh, the mayor was pretty strong. Uh, and all the cops were fired immediately. They've been fired, which means there's probably going to be a lot of um, PBA influence and in not trying to get these police indicted. So I think we have a little bit of um, video here, but we can't hear it. So Okay, well, I'm going to move forward um, because that video doesn't seem to be coming up. So we have, a, a, hopefully this video will work. Um, in San Leandro, there has been uh, white people posting that they're going to attack the people, people of color in that community. Let's see if we can pull that up. Sometimes the internet's kind of not the greatest where I live in Albany, New York. So there could be some technical difficulties. We try to avoid those as much as we can, but things happen. So let's see if we can hear that one. Oh, thank you, Jared. Yeah. Uh, Jairus's piece, Rosa and Tandi. I'm always riffing off the work of Sophia Umoja Noble when it comes to the impact of these videos and the internet in general on the psyches of Black people. It's brilliant work she does. And you guys could check out um, Jared's work at I Mix What I Like 
dot org, and um, he has a he has an interview with her about how these have just become really traumatic, you know. So, all right. Okay, well, let's see if our guests are going to come on. <laughs> We're waiting for um, Keen Noir and Jasmine to come up. I wanted to talk about um, sexuality and, and what happens in a global pandemic when it comes to your sexuality and, and your partnerships. If people have them, I think it's something we definitely need to uh, address and talk about. Yeah, I'm, we're having a lot of technical difficulties today, so I'm not sure what's happening. So I'm sorry, everybody. Okay, yeah, we'll pull the press conference up then that you have. We have the press conference um, that happened in Minnesota a couple hours ago. There's no sound. Well, while we try to get the sound, let me just read what just happened um, in Minneapolis a couple hours ago. Yesterday, there were four Minneapolis, Minneapolis officers. Um, who had tackled um, the brother George Floyd. Um, what happened is he went to go purchase some groceries and they thought he was he's, he was forging a they thought he was forging a check and they called the police. And this encounter unfortunately led to the death of George Floyd. For four Minneapolis police officers were fired Tuesday authorities said as state and federal authorities investigated the arrest of a black man who died after being pinned to the ground. Video of the incident shared on social media captured the man identified as George Floyd by Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Frey repeatedly telling the officers, I cannot breathe. An increasingly distraught crowd of onlookers pleaded with the officer to move his knee um, and I have watched the video. I watched it one time. I won't watch it again. We've chosen not to, to share it uh, for the reasons I discussed earlier. But, um, you know, for, of all the videos I've seen, I, I, I never think it can get worse and it gets worse every time. And this uptick in police brutality and police harassment and what happened in Central Park with this white woman who didn't want this guy filming her because she didn't have her dog on a leash. Um, what's, what's her name? Amy Cooper is her name. She didn't have her dog on a leash. There's a part, a central part that is there for animals, but they have to have a leash. And he was taping that. And she went up to him and he kept saying, please don't come any closer, ma'am. You know, you're supposed to have your dog on a leash. And she basically called 911 and went from like three levels. An African-American man is threatening me. Then she screamed, there's a man here threatening me. And then she like, it was the best acting I've ever seen. <laughs> She's like, there's an African-American man threatening me, me and my dog. As she's doing this and calling the police, she's also choking the dog because she's holding him by the leash. Well, she was fired today and her dog actually was taken away from the people that let her adopt the dog, right? And it's very good that the brother just stood 
you know, where he stood. But this, we all know this, all these encounters are never good for us. But at least she's fired from her job and uh, her dog, or what used to be her dog, is with people who care about the dog and not and and follow the rules of having your dog on a leash. But you know what? I'm excited because I see my brother Joaquin and we're just going to start and bring him up because he is working double duty as a doctor. So let me just read you a little bit about Joaquin. Um, Joaquin was born and raised in New York City. He attended Cornell University. That's where we met when I was there at Cornell. He completed his um, program in pre-medical sciences from the City College of New York. And he ended up, re um, excuse me, he, he attended the School of Latin America, the Medicine School of Latin America in Cuba, graduating with the class of 2012. Dr. Morante returned to New York and has been working in several hospitals. But in this time of COVID, um, He's been working over time, you know. We have another mutual friend that also went to Cornell, uh, Jonelle Daffins, who's a doctor in, in, in New Orleans, you know, and I really wanted to bring on not only someone that I trust, someone that went through the best um, medical program in the world and what he's, he's currently dealing with um, where he works at Jacoby Medical Center in the Bronx. And he has a wife and two children and I'm just glad that he was able to be here with us today. Hi, Joaquin. Hey, what's up? What's up, doctor? How are you? I'm well, I'm well. What's going Good. on, man? You know, I mean, I just, people ask questions, you know, I've been texting you since all this happened. And I, I think one of the things that has stuck with me is the first thing you said was try to avoid going to a hospital at this moment. Um, but you were also telling me that you intubate a lot of patients and that you didn't have the correct PPE and intubating is a very close thing. You're like right in the patient's, you know, face putting a tube down so that that can breathe for them. But when you told me that once you're on an intubated, less than 20% people ever come out of that, I, I think I was shocked by that. I didn't know that. I, I assume that you're intubated and you get better. And that's why we need respiratory machines and all of that. But there were a lot of things you told me. Um, so now we're almost three months into to the COVID crisis. Can you tell us what those first days were like? And did you all have any information that this virus was spreading like within medical teams? Did you all know it was coming before people here started taking it seriously? Um, yeah, I mean, so I am a, I'm a pulmonary critical care doctor um, at a public hospital here in the Bronx. Um, and it was around February um, where, you know, again, China and Wuhan, COVID appears in January. Uh, we see what's happening in Wuhan. Um, I think the big, uh, the, the, when the alarms began to sound is when we found out that they were building a hospital in three days, that they needed to increase their capacity to be able to take care of all these hospitalized patients. Um, and then as it slowly crept up or crept this way, um, from the east coming west through Europe and then uh, initially landing in the United States and Washington um, and then here in New York. Um, we knew that this virus had the ability to overwhelm health systems. We saw what was going on um, in China and in Italy um, and the how quickly it was, it would, you know, kind of just take over health systems, it took over hospitals um, and filled the wards with patients. And um, because we lack a robust public health system, a, a system that can respond and really be more proactive, um, we were caught, we were caught. Um, and so here in New York, 
the hospital wards, the emergency rooms quickly became flooded with COVID patients. I remember uh, it was in the middle of March, March uh, 16th, about that when, you know, I had went into the ICU and I had one COVID positive patient and by, and that was on a Monday and by the Friday, um, the ICU was almost completely COVID positive patients. Um, and the fact that we didn't have enough PPE for nurses and ancillary staff and doctors, and that we're still continuing not to use uh, personal protective equipment as um, we've normally used it. In other words, one N95 mask per patient interaction, and that we use one N95 mask per shift if you're um, in a place that actually has that to give to you. Um, is is still quite alarming and it's still uh you know something that does not make sense right but you know this was uh, a pandemic where we did not plan um even though we knew what was going on in january we did not plan nationally to respond to this and to be prepared for it so that's what that's that's what that early experience was and I mean, was it just like one day steady and then the next day it just exploded? It felt, you know, uh, it felt it was the first days were, as I said, you know, it's like, I remember you know, one gentleman, then there were three patients. By the end of the week, my hosp the, the ICU was filled up. And I, I would say by the end of that week of March 16th, at least where I was working, um, it felt like a bomb exploded on the corner of the hospital um, where we were going down to the emergency room. The, the emergency department and the Department of Critical Care work uh, hand in hand. In other words, critically ill patients usually come into the emergency room. Uh, they're triaged by the emergency room physicians. And then those who need to come to a unit, to an intensive care unit, are then handed over to us and we take care of them. On top of that, internal uh, the intensive care unit doctors take care of patients who are critically ill, who may have been initially admitted to the hospital, to the general medical wards, but who have deteriorated and need to come in to the unit uh, for you know kind of more intense therapy. That's the intensive uh, care part. Um, and. I remember walking into the emergency room being called to see patients and it, uh, it feeling like a bomb had gone off um, down the block because they were coming in, you know, at, that, at, at a rapidity, at a speed that we just could not handle. It felt like you couldn't handle. I remember being on one night shift and talking to the respiratory therapist and the respiratory therapist saying, no, Dr. Moranta, we have one vent left in the hospital. And actually the way that we ensured that we had more vents is that, you know, people, our community members, you know, grandmothers and grandfathers and mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters um, were dying. And we would take that vent and then move it to the next, you know, and that's how, that's how intense uh, it became, you know. I mean, also because the Bronx has some of the, if not the highest rates of people with asthma, were were you at the beginning seeing, you know, elderly people mostly, and then it started being like younger folks and children, because at the beginning, and I think that they were saying just older people, because in this country, there's not a respect for elderly people. Like, well, they live their lives, so it's not that bad because it's only older people. But did you see all types, uh, all ages of patients? Yeah, I mean, when when you look at the data, um, so there's a couple of different points is what I hear is, number one, if you look at the data in terms of the Bronx alone, the Bronx per, in, in terms of cases per 100,000, we have uh, been, hardest hit, we're the most affected borough um, 
of the five boroughs is, is the Bronx, then Brooklyn, and then Queens. Um, when it comes now down to people with um, comorbidities, with other chronic illnesses, you know, that is an indication of poverty. This is nothing surprising to us, right? We, it's, it's not just asthma, it's diabetes, it's hypertension, it's obesity, it's chronic kidney disease, it's uh, high cholesterol, it's, the, uh, it's congestive heart failure from long time, long standing hypertension. And, you know, it's also looking at population health, one of those things looking at maternal fetal health, right? Looking at uh, uh, infant mortality in New York City. And we have places in the Bronx and in Brooklyn where infant mortality is on par with uh, countries that are considered third world countries. Um, those things, the fact that COVID came in and hit our communities hardest uh, was not surprising. Um, there was talk of, oh, people who are going to be greater than 75 are going to be most affected. And when you look at the numbers here in New York City, Blacks and Latinos greater than 75, I think the, the numbers that I saw today is about 1,700 per, per every 100,000 cases were Black and Latino people greater than 75. So our grandfathers and grandmothers were the ones who were hardest hit not just nursing home residents, but you know, people who are older generally have more chronic conditions and people who are older are the most frail. Not just COVID, but influenza. COVID is just a very malicious, I would say almost evil virus at this point um, because of uh, the, its lethality in some of our older generation. Um, but when you look at then look the next group over uh, who are from 65 to 74, we're still way above uh, the white population here in New York City. If, if you know, if for your listeners and your viewers, well, the data is there on NewYorkCity.gov. They have the COVID data and you can, and you can see the, the, the breakdown by race. The, another piece, as I was just reading from the other day, was 6% of the total COVID cases seen in New York City were people who live in public housing. So yeah. that talks to the economics. That talks to that this is, this is race and class. And, you know, when you have 6% of, your, of the total group that was affected coming from New York City public housing, that's six of every 100 people. Um, mm -hmm. And... That's a that's a that's a huge number when we're talking about 190 196 thousand cases of po COVID positive cases, right? And we're and we're now at about 20 thousand deaths um, in New York City. If we were to take the reported number of confirmed and suspected, but again, we believe that that's an, there's an underreporting there because there's many people who died at home. Um, who were never swabbed and we never had, and there was never a belief that they had COVID because we didn't know why they, they, they ended up passing away. So, you know, when I was talking to you one of the times, you also said that no one at this moment can figure out the virus. That, you know, I've read things about it mutating. I've read things about it attacking other parts of um, your, your systems. Is, is that correct information? So, or? so I think in the initial stages, um, and it, yes. So this is, you know, when you have a novel virus, novel is brand new. We've never seen SARS-CoV-2 before. Um, it's different than SARS. It's different than MERS, which are its cousins. Um, it, it, the way it enters the body um, is different, you know. Uh, it, it, it enters through, has a couple of different ports of entries. One is through the lungs, another one is through the kidneys, is what we believe. And, and in terms of looking at its, how it causes destruction, we're beginning to understand a little bit about the body's 
uh, robust immune response. In other words, the, the body sees this virus, the, the virus causes damage by just coming into the body, but then also the, your own immune system overreacts and then creates uh, you know, this inflammation, this total body inflammation that's very difficult to stop once it gets going. Um, and as we've, as we have dealt with more and more cases, you know, what we've tried to do is not cause harm, you know, uh, be able to support people through the illness. Um, this data is still out on whether any of these antivirals are working. And when I mean antivirals, we're talking about, you know, remdesivir, um, which is a big one that's been uh, talked about. You know, we still know that you know, the latest from the New England Journal of Medicine is that hydroxychloroquine, Trump's favorite drug, really doesn't provide any benefit. Um, we're still looking at other treatment modalities like convalescent plasma. Um, there's other medications that help to decrease inflammation, and we're also looking at what what are going to be the outcomes. You know, I've been lucky enough to at Jacoby, where I work, we've had multiple clinical trials running through the hospital so that, you know, our community has had access, those people, to those to the different trial medications, but we don't know what, what works and what doesn't. You know, for us, the, it's going right, right back to basics as if you had any virus, and it's really providing excellent supportive care to the people to our community members who walk through the doors who are sick and trying to get them um, stable and being patient and understanding that we really need to aid them through this disease um, and hope that their body um, is is able to kind of fight it off and, and get them. So in those first weeks, <clears throat> Did you and your colleagues have to ever make a choice of like, we have one ventilator and we have three people? No, 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 okay. no we didn't. We, I, you know, again, I work at Jacoby. I also work part time at Montefiore System. I trained at Montefiore System. I was in every hospital here in the, I was at all the Montes campuses and, and I was at Jacoby's campus and I was even at North Central Bronx. I, I, I was in many different hospitals. And fortunately, we, you know, at least when I was working, we were never faced with those decisions. I think where there were tough decisions about um, who would benefit from really aggressive care. Um, and I think that those are conversations, you know, as, as healthcare professionals, and as always, I say, as someone who works in a public hospital, we are given a public trust, right? The, the, our community mm -hmm. trusts us to take care of them and trust us to do what's right. Um, and the data has shown, and we saw it that, you know, if you came in and you were in really, really bad shape with you know, acute respiratory failure and you're really bad and, and you had certain comorbidities, the chances were really stacked against you that you, um, depending on where you, how you were clinically, that you were gonna be able to survive this. And I saw, especially emergency room physicians really struggle with triaging because it felt like war. It felt like a bomb went off. And I don't know if you've ever seen or, or, or ever heard of how you triage in a war. If a bomb goes off, you have to then be able to see who is, you have to make decisions about who can be saved and who may be beyond mm -hmm. saving so that the people who can be saved can be attended to. And there was some feeling of that, some feeling of that, and when we were really in the midst of it, um, and I think that that was uh, that was tremendously uh, it, it impacted. I could see how it impacted doctors and nurses and uh, and other ancillary staff in the hospital to see these tough decisions 
um, and to have to make these really tough decisions. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that was the heartbreaking, really hard part because I, I mean, I live, uh, I can walk to Jacoby. Um, I can walk to Montefiore. I live in the same care. I grew up and kind of live in the same place where I work. And well, I've been in the hospital and I've seen people be like, Hey, Joaquin, they like, Oh shit. I didn't even know. You. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even know you were a doctor. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and no, it's okay. you know, it's, and, and it's the, not, <laughs> this is like the, We're not right the, the broadcasting <laughs> is not going to throw us off. Um, so I have a, a, you know, for, for, for myself, there was a real sense of, I need to really try to do the right thing to try to help people. And most of the help that I could provide because of how vicious this thing was for the critically ill. Again, I am an intensive care physician. I see the sickest of the sick, right? Um, uh, a, a lot of the support that we could give was the emotional support, not only to, to the person, the patient that was lying in a bed, but also to their family members. Because I, and we are all keenly aware that medicine does not save all. And that when medicine can no longer provide a cure, that we must pivot towards comfort. We must be the ones to support those people and their family members through what is inevitably the, the toughest time that they're gonna be facing right now. Um, and that's what we were trying to do. Um, there was no, you know, making this, there was no death panels or anything like that. I think as, as, as doctors and nurses and healthcare staff that, you know, we're, we're not here to be uh, playing God. I think that we're, we're here to try to do the best that we can with the resources that we have in our hands. Did, did you lose some of your colleagues? Um, so I lost a professor of mine from when I was uh, in pulmonary fellowship. Uh, uh, he he um, actually died of COVID this past week um, after spending about three weeks on a ventilator. Um, uh, I've had, you know, doctors who trained me who got sick and, and got better, but, you know, also had us very worried. Um, uh, you know, I've, because I'm from New York, you know, I had the phone calls from cousins who are, hey, can you check in on this person? And, you know, I was having to make uh, doctor's visits to the South Bronx and, and really seeing, you know, um, how this thing could run through a community. Like, you know, when I went to go see my cousin's uh, family and, you know, there were six people living in an apartment and two of them were sick. And that means that the other four are inevitably, you know, in potential harm of getting really sick, you know, hopefully, you know, and, and they, it, everything turned out okay with them. But um, the, there was a little bit of, Unpre there was an unpredictable nature. Um, I had 29 year olds uh, who died from this disease coming to the ICU. At, we had a 25 year old, uh, 40 year olds, um, 50 to 60. I mean, the, 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 yes, it affected the older, you know, our, our grandmothers and our grandfathers, that, that population that's greater than 75, but, but also, you know, it, it, it hit us. Um, in, in other ways. And could you talk about now this Kawasaki-like disease or that is happening to children? Yeah, I, you know, I'm not a pediatric doc. Um, I, and, and there've been, so I, I'm not the person to be able to give really good medical advice on it. I, I know that, uh, there is a hyper um, inflammatory response that we believe is happening in a small population of pediatric patients. Um, and some of them are actively COVID positive and others have been, have gotten the disease, have kind of gotten better and then had this, this hyper inflammatory kind of Kawasaki vasculitis um, response. And so but I'm, I, 
know very little. And again, they're not, it's not a lot of cases, um, but it is something that we need to look at. I mean, this, this is a, a new virus that is attacking the body in new ways that we haven't seen before. Um, you know, and so with time, we're, we're learning kind of as we go. So what, what does it look like in the next couple of months? Like, especially in New York City where it's just so dense and then it's going to be hot and we already seen people going out and all, all of that. I mean, are you and your colleagues talking about already preparing for what they say could be a second wave or are yeah. we going to be in this for a long time? Is it here and we're all vaccinated? We may not be safe. And then how do you vaccinate that many people? Like, I guess those are the things you're all, all researching and trying to yeah, figure out. I mean, as a medical community, I think uh, what, what I do know is the social distancing works, right? Because we went from being absolutely inundated with cases. I mean, just feeling like we were not going to be able to get out from underneath this thing to next thing you know, it felt like you know, I think I read an article where somebody, he really described it was like somebody just turned off the, fa the faucet where, you know, things just slowed down immensely. Um, and right now, you know, when I, like I worked last night, we're taking care of people who have now been in the hospital for four weeks or five weeks who aren't quite getting better. But, you know, in terms of new cases, we don't have these new cases that are just coming, this deluge of new cases that are coming in. So the social distancing obviously has worked, you know, because there's that, that's been the intervention. Um, as we open up, what will it look like? You know, are we going to be, should we be, be preparing for this thing to go in waves where, you know, we open up, a whole bunch of Just people get sick, in there. we take care of them, we close back down, the cases go down, uh, we open back up, cases go up, we close back. I mean, is that what we're looking at for the next, uh, you know, year? Possibly. Possibly, um, it it really all depends on how well we can get testing out there so that we can be able to contact trace. Um, you know, we've seen that in Asia, you know, contact tracing has worked um, to be able to quickly identify. Walking, well, breaking up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, is it me? No, you were breaking up a little bit, but I mean, every we heard most of what you said and, and the contact tracing, but I mean, so, so the social distancing works. Mm -hmm. but we're, no, we're seeing, I can't even imagine what the summer could look like in New York City, you know? And again, for people who are living three, four, five people, so many of our folks still live, you know, in a two bedroom apartment with six people, you know? so. I mean, the social distancing works. So that's what, that's the most that we can do right now. And also be healthier in whatever ways we can be to build up our immune systems. Yeah, I, I think prevention is key. You know, uh, with, this is still a virus that um, is airborne and contact, right? You know, you're going to, pick it up and touch your mouth and touch your eyes and touch your nose and, and uh, possibly get infected that way, or someone's going to cough and you're going to inhale it. Um, and so prevention and not putting yourself in situations, wearing a mask and washing your hands, that's still the, the, fun, the backbone right, of this thing. Um, and there's things that we need to do as a uh, as a public health, you know, inf we need to develop public health infrastructure. We don't, we, it's something that we have not done and we, you know, don't uh, value it. We value putting money towards, uh, you know, the military. We are, you know, like I said, uh, if you at the end of this still believe that savage capitalism works, you must be insane.
um, because this is this we are not going to be able to buy our way out of. This. Yeah. So you broke up a little bit. You're breaking up. Um, what you just said was, if we put... Joaquin, hold on a second. You yeah. broke up a little bit. Yeah. Say the part about capitalism and I, the savageness. Of yeah, it. yeah. Just, you know that. Yeah. I just think that you know this is this is where we can learn from other countries when it comes to how we um, organize our healthcare system, um, and it comes back to why blacks and Latinos were the sickest, um, why uh, you know why the the poorest of the poor are getting sick. Why is it that the essential worker is the hardest hit? Is because Blacks and Latinos have always been the backbone of savage capitalism. We always have been the ones to, you know, kind of keep the economic engine going. Um, this country has, you know, works off of our backs. And so we are the essential worker. Um, right. But that doesn't necessarily go hand in hand with making sure that we're the healthiest in this population. Um, and so, you know, if you, if if we think that you know what we've been doing is going to continue to to is is something that we should go back to, I think that that's just insane. Um, it does not make sense. It doesn't make sense. And so that's that's the macro, and on the micro is the hand washing, the wearing a mask, and the social distancing that you need to to do to make sure that you keep yourself and your family safe, and that you're keeping others safe. Mm -hmm. So before we let you go, how, you know, it must have an impact on you, you know, um, every day and worried about not only your patients and people, your family. I mean, what do you do to make sure that your psyche is okay? Because, you know, in talking to you and Jonelle, um, for those that just joined, um, um, Jonelle Daffins is an ER um, ER emergency room doctor in New Orleans, and we're all comrades. We all graduated from Cornell. Um, how do you deal with that? I mean, you know, how, do you talk to a therapist? Do you you're like this is what I was built for? You know, going to Cuba is the is the best medical program. Everybody says in the world. And I remember you saying, well, I'm built for this, but what do you have to do to keep yourself going? Or is it that you just are built for this and you're prepared? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's kind of a couple of things. I mean, one is that professionally, I'm a, I'm a intensive care doc, right? And so kind of, you know, dealing with very sick people is part of my job description. Um, but what I think about more than anything is the impact that this has had on our community, right? Um, and not just how am I going to take care of myself, but how do I continue to take care of my community, my family, my wife, my kids, my mother, my father, you know, and, and, and continue to make sure that we stay united and loving and care for one another in a time of social distancing, um, in a time where I'm, you know, trying to make sure that they uh, stay as disciplined as possible to limit their exposure because they're in that demographic. Um, so, and, and I think for me, how I personally deal with that is by understanding that I have, uh, you know, a purpose and that I have that you know, I rather me being from the Bronx, me being a Puerto Rican Dominican kid from the Bronx, I would be, a, this is what I'm supposed to do, right? I'm supposed to be taking care of my people. Um, and that is, that gives me the satisfaction to know that in a very tough time, at least I'm in the right place. Um, mm -hmm. And We'll deal, I think, as a community, we will have to heal. We will have to heal from losing, you know, very important family members, you know, and, and that will put time, you know, time will, with time, we will address that 
Um, so in a roundabout way, what I'm saying is uh, that I'm gonna keep doing my job and I'm gonna keep hugging my kids and I'm gonna keep you know, hugging my wife and, and keeping people safe um, because we have a long way to go. This is not over. We're not even close. We are, you know, people talk about, you know, opening up and, or the second wave. And yeah. I heard somebody say second wave, we're just in the second inning. Um, you know, like this is, you know, this is to, to believe that, you know, in three months, oh, pandemic over, we're good. That's, uh, that's unrealistic. That's unrealistic. And it's just not based in, it's not based in what is our reality right now. Our reality is that the cases in other parts of the United States continue to rise. Here in New York, we have at least 800 new cases per day. Um, that, you know, almost a thousand new cases per day. That's, uh, that's nowhere near, Hey, you know, this thing is all taken care of. Um, right. we don't have a vaccine. We don't even know if we, if there's going to be a working vaccine. Um, you know, there, there's still a lot of unknowns. There's still a lot of variables that need to be kind of sorted out. And so, uh, we have to stay in the fight and stay disciplined and continue to, you know, keep our eye on the prize of making sure that we take care of one another so that when we do get eventually to the end of this thing, that we come out stronger because, you know, uh, as a community, you see how it's very easy. I mean, not only are we fighting COVID, but we're also fighting, you know, economic, you know, the economic destruction of this on our community. And then we have to deal with the police. Yeah. And then all the things that are happening, if you're, you're a woman or a man who's being in a domestic abusive situation, I, I think about all the kids where school is not only a feeding where they eat, but so for a lot of kids who are abused, school has is the refuge from that. And now everybody's together and all these things. But I, I, I want to bring you back again. You know, um, I think it's so important that our people see <laughs> black and Puerto Rican Latino doctors that also, I mean, you know, when you're around and as a, as a Puerto Rican Dominican doctor, you, you are not going to allow for that racial <laughs> disparity to happen on your watch, which is critically important since um, we're the least believed, especially as black or Latino women, when we say we're in pain and all of these things that happen. And I just really want to thank you for coming on. I know you've been on months, just back to back to back. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for Jonelle. I'm grateful y'all went to Cuba and you both came back into our communities. Um, and I appreciate you and your family and so much love for 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 what you're doing, like you said, for our community. So thank you, Dr. Joaquin Morante. <laughs> I'm going to bring you at, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to bother you, but I'm also going to check in on you all the time. And and again, I know from everyone who's watching, especially Leslie and uh, Jared and Bai and everybody that went to Cornell sent me text already on mm -hmm. um, you and that we're in family together. Thank you for your work. Thank you for helping and, and saving people's lives, literally. Yeah, no, no problem, man. Yeah. Love you, man. You be safe. I will. I'm listening to everything you say, so I'll, right, I'll be safe. Okay, love you. Bye now. Peace. All right. Peace. Okay. Oh, you know what, you guys? I'm doing Instagram Live again. We have our next guest on. I, I hope that everybody... Um, I know you asked some questions and um, we'll figure out how to get, I'll get the answers and send them to a couple of people. But, you know, I, I think it's so important that we have doctors that are also political revolutionaries and they they know what we need and will fight for us. So I, I, I'm i really grateful for Joaquin coming on and we'll bring him back and some other doctors um, around the country that have been doing incredible work in their communities. So now we're gonna transition to uh, y'all, some of you know him as Hassan Salam. I know him as Hassan. I also know him as Keen Moore. And I also know Jasmine. And the thing is, I, I don't even want to get into a biography of this. I have to, are they, let's bring them on.
Tandi, because <laughs> let me tell you, these are the last two people I saw before all this went down. That's fair. It was a little, you know, I was in LA, I was in LA on a visit. Is that my, is that feedback from me? Can you hear us all right? I wasn't sure that. Oh yeah, you're perfect now. Um, and I'm glad because uh, it was a very healing uh, conversation I had with you uh, about some things I have been going through. So I just want you all to tell the audience because I can hear mood feedback, so I'm not going to keep talking too much. But I want to hear um, you describe the work that you do. And um, I think it's important that we talk about sexuality and, and, and all of that. But Jasmine, you also do a lot of post-traumatic work for people who have been abused or who um, um, have, have issues around intimacy because of past traumas. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that? Absolutely. King is just trying to help adjust that feedback. We thought that it might be coming from a fan. Um, he'll be jumping right back in. So thank you so much for, for um, having us to to share a little bit about what we've been doing as of late. Um, I am a clinical therapist and do work with a host of people um, around issues related to sex and sexuality and also um, just general, you know, general mental health issues. Like right now we are seeing a lot of situational depression and anxiety, as you can imagine, secondary to um, what the physician was just sharing. We are all going through some type of mental health in, uh, uptick, if you will. Um, so my company, Blue Pearl Therapy, does offer virtual therapy to help with things uh, as um, maybe, I, how to say it, as temporary as something like a situational depressive um, episode or as um, extensive as chronic illness and some of the issues that come along with chronic illness, um, injury, and or traumatic events. Yeah, and and Hassan, if you could talk a little bit about, I don't think it's like a transition from you being a hip hop artist and an activist, but, um, your journey into the, into the world of erotica and um, really talking about sexuality issues that for some reason people are still embarrassed to even have these conversations. So can you talk a little bit about that? Not transition, but how you add it more to your life. Yeah, for sure. Um, actually, it's, it's funny because I started in adult entertainment before I ever put out an album. You know, it was adult entertainment that even paid for me to get into the studio to put out my first mixtape, to put out my first album. You know, um, I just wasn't out there uh, in the capacity that I am now. Um, you know, I think that sexual expression is just as important and as is another form of artistic expression. You know, a healthy sex life is part of a healthy life in general, along with you know, making sure your mental health is okay, your physical health, your spiritual health, emotional health, you know, sexual health falls into actually overlapping in a lot of those categories as well. And I think also along the sense of, you know, coming from hip hop, you know, there's a lot of toxic masculinity that's involved in hip hop, you know, and I, and I wanted to, at the same time, as I still continue to push my music and, and, and share my music with the world, I wanted to actually confront some of those ideas that seem to permeate our culture and are strangling our culture, unfortunately, because we are, um, a lot of hip hop folk are unable to get past the parts of us that was bad. You know, there are certain, there are certain parts of every single person, every single culture, every everything that we need to be able to look back on or look in the mirror at and be like, I need to fix that. I need to change that. I need to be better. You know, and one of the ways um, for me is the way that, you know, women are treated in hip hop. Uh, the LGBTQIA community is treated in hip hop. And so, you know, we work on that through webinars, lectures, and then actually putting it on film and putting it on screen and showing how people can work together and come together. 
making sure that there's proper representation of us in all forms of media. I think sometimes, you know, we don't want to go to some of those places that make us feel uncomfortable and permeate those uh, areas as well, because maybe we're, you know, have this shame and stigma around sex and sexuality, be it come from the church, be it come from our families trying to keep us safe and telling us all kinds of myths and scary things about sex and sexuality right. because we don't have the language to be able to have these kind of conversations freely. So for us, it was like, there's an area of art and entertainment that do not represent us properly. Not even just art and entertainment. This is how people learn about sex. You know, adult content for majority of people, every time we go around and we host our sex positive parenting class, about a good 95% of the people say that they learned their first introduction to sex was adult content. So not that we're creating adult content for um, people who should not be, like children who shouldn't be accessing adult material, but there are a lot of young adults or, pe or people who stumble across adult entertainment and they either don't see themselves reflected or what they do see is quite dangerous, you know, dangerous to the to our internet our psyche. I was a little um, let's because we can't do anything about it. Can you say that one more time, Rosa? Can you say that one more time? Yeah, you you all are freezing up. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're freezing up a little bit. Okay. We can hear you now. Oh, no, sorry. Okay. Can you close out some of the stuff on your thing? I'll turn up the light around. Mm -hmm. Can you both hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. We're getting a lot of feedback on this. I don't know why, but... um. Um, can you talk about that idea of, I still think that parents our age, we should know better because our parents didn't do it right. And I think we repeat the same things our parents do to our children, even though we know better. Mm -hmm. How, how, how do you help with that? You know, do you do, when you do these parenting classes, are you finding that still the idea of sexuality, especially with a lot of kids are not gender fluid mm -hmm. and their parents don't understand that? Yeah. I think one of the main things that happens in these mm -hmm. parenting groups is, is okay, keep going. Okay. I'm not doing that so you keep talking. Mm -hmm. I think one of the main things that happens in these parenting groups is that we um give parents or soon to be parents or want to be parents an opportunity to confront their own shame and their own feelings and their own embarrassment and awkwardness and fears around sex. And I don't think, you know, I mean, we could say this is true for all kinds of parenting. It's like none of us get a, a handbook or a class where it's like, okay, what did your parents do? Okay, don't do that. Here's a template of what to do. You know, um, a, a lot of times it's like, just don't be like, you know, don't be better than your parents, but there's still nothing to model. You know, mm -hmm. you tell me if I need to go back. Oh, no. I, what I was realizing is that now that I have the headphones on, uh -huh. people on Instagram, but we'll post it later. Um, no, but continue. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, it's one thing if you want to do better, but it's another thing if you don't have a model to follow. It's just all I know is what's familiar and what, you know, we always kind of look at ourselves and go, we turned out okay. Every generation says that. We turned out okay. So when we give them an opportunity to really confront, you know, what are your what are your shames? What what put you in this position where it's so hard for you to say, you know, um, I want to have sex with this person or no, thank you. I, do, I don't want to have sex or I like sex this way. You know, we kind of help parents take that barrier away from from within themselves so that we they actually have space to have these conversations with their kids. We also model it. Um, you could, if you want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've posted modeling, how to have these conversations. Yeah, I think a lot of people make this, we, we were told, you know, when we were younger, you know, did you have that talk? You yeah. know, <laughs> and there is not one talk that's gonna explain sexuality and, you know, grooming, cleanliness, 
and how to navigate dating that's going to happen. You know, it's not going to happen in one conversation. It's one of those things that has to be continuous. You know, with our newborn, well, newborn now, about to be two year old, we've been using proper and correct terminology with him since he was born, right? So as he grows older and we start to have these conversations about, okay, well, this is how you wash your penis, or this is, you're not supposed to be doing this out in public. This is for your own private time and things of that nature. He'll be comfortable even hearing the words. You know, for a lot of people, They've been they've been told the improper terminology that you know they've heard PP pocketbook down there and all these things that then when they actually hear correct terminology it's like giggle inducing yeah. or mm -hmm. they feel yeah. shame automatically when they hear it so you know that's one thing and it's also empowering our kids that if God forbid something happens to them that they need to then go share to you know to their parents to a teacher to the police or whoever that someone has been touching them, you know, they're not going to be afraid to actually say what's happening to protect themselves, you know, and it's, it's very important. The reason why we say that is because in some states they have laws that if a child does not use the proper terminology, then they're not going to prosecute whoever that predator was or is, oh. you know, so they have to say, okay, this person touched my penis or my vagina or my breast. If they don't say that, in some of these states, you know, the lobby for uh, pedophiles, I guess, was was strong and they made these laws that really protects predators when we want to protect our children. And, you know, it's important to start doing that from a young age. And then when you get older and it comes to the condom conversation or the are you ready and prepared to actually go forth with sharing your body with somebody else? It's not something that's coming completely out of left field. You know, they've been building for these conversations their entire lives. That's fascinating. I never heard of laws like that. that have yeah. So so where they're questioning children, um, as they do in, in, in these situations where I'm um, trying to kind of do some fact finding and, you know, if children are uncomfortable or they're unable to co-op to add context to their story and you say, well, so-and-so took something out my pocketbook. Right. Well, you know, well, the, the child doesn't really even know if he touched her bag or her body. Um, and if, you know, and then of course, in those situations we see where children get confused. Well, did that happen? I'm not even supposed to be saying anything about this. Now I'm confused. No, nothing happened. I don't, you know, so, so these things really can trip our children up if they're ever even put in a position where they need to explain to us, um, you know, what happened to them and, or, you know, what somebody uh, it might be grooming them for. We are trying to help them with having the language to speak about their bodies as comfortably and confidently as possible and as accurately as possible, as well as having autonomy over their body. If you can, if you, if I give you permission to, you know, to see it, say it, touch it and own it, then you protect it very differently, mm -hmm. right? You also treat it very differently when it's yours. You're not waiting for something to happen to your body. You're in control of your body. Um, it also helps you with when someone says, well, I just want to, um, can, can I use you as an example? Sure. Okay, so you, a lot of times people say like, don't let the way that we general, generationally in the past have raised our kids, don't let nobody touch you down there. Don't let nobody touch your breath or your butt, right? We keep it to three things. Predatory behavior does not start with grabbing your crotch. It starts here. Hi, how are you? Mm -hmm. You doing okay? And then mm -hmm. this child is thinking, okay, well, she's not touching my chest. She's not touching my butt. She's not touching my, my genitals, my pocketbook, whatever. So we're okay. And then it goes, you know, so, you know, I've been thinking about you, mm -hmm. right? And now at this point, it's like, I don't really like how that feels, but mom said, just don't let nobody touch my pocket. But by the time I get to the pocketbook, I've touched this person's entire body and I've made them confused if they invited my touch or not. You know, right. so you can tell our kids yeah. where on your body you don't want to be touched, then you, you can start articulating that now. And that goes for the aunts that want the kisses too long or, the, or kisses at all or the <laughs> uncle that wants yeah. to sit on a lap mm -hmm. or anybody for that matter. To empower your children to know that their body is their body you know, is is one of the main things 
that that will empower them for the rest of their lives right. to understand what consent is and also not just consent for things happening to them but things that they might do to other people because it's like hey what did we teach you your body is yours well that means their body is theirs so you right. should be touching them in a way that they don't feel um okay with either and then one one i'm, I'm gonna push you just a little bit more in your audience what about teaching our kids about pleasure yeah you know what i mean um, too often, and you know, we find that as we we get older and we're you're in in these more evolved relationships, we sometimes find that some one person in that dynamic is leading the pleasure, or nobody's talking about pleasure. We're just doing the mechanical thing. Mm -hmm. Hope it feels good because we're told that that's what we're supposed to mm -hmm. do in a relationship, but we have never explored or yeah. tried anything to actually enhance our pleasure or the parts of pleasure that we do enjoy, we haven't built upon it at all. Right. You know, so a lot of times people grow up to never really truly experience pleasure. You know, there are still guys out there who deny that women even have orgasms out of the fear of pleasure for somebody else. And that you know, they are not it's interested it's in it. sharing in or providing that pleasure. It's interesting you say that because um for those that know Dr. Joan Morgan now, um, that is part of her work that she has done in her dissertation around pleasure activism, mm -hmm. you know? And now hearing it from you both. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think about just when I was growing up, especially as a Catholic, I mean, all the kind of things I know my parents didn't mean to, or especially my mom, but, you know, I never felt until recently uh, that I even deserved to have a sex feel good. Mm -hmm. And part of that comes from um, being sexually assaulted when I molested when I was little and then kind of going into that path of what they call being promiscuous and then I got to the point where I was like, well, this is all men want, so this is all I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is a conversation I was having with you um, when we saw each other, because I had gotten, and I, I, I'm not out of it yet, but I definitely got, had gotten to the point where the more I recall the trauma, the less and less I want to be intimate with my husband. You know, and I, and I told you all that because... I came home and me and just had a good, a really good conversation about it. But I still felt like, why are you being a baby about it? You're like almost a 50 year old woman. Why can't you still say what you want and what you need without being embarrassed? Yeah. Well, trauma definitely um, will show up at it the most inconvenient time, right? Mm -hmm. So now that that you are an um, in a mature marriage, you are able to speak out on all of these other areas of discomfort and, and different platforms. There's that one little thing that's like, yeah, but you haven't conquered me yet. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And, you know, it's like now that things have probably like, or, you know, your, your relationship is secure, your daughter that, you know, is growing up a little less dependent on you now. Um, there's space and time for you to start to deal with with your own hangups. And I think what happens when children or young people or anybody really is sexually assaulted, that takes our voice. Yeah. It takes, you know, it takes, it, it, it takes your ability to speak up on behalf of yourself. Like you said, I didn't feel like I deserve. And, and that's part of being victimized. You know, that, that ownership of your body, that, that um, connection between your brain and your, your sexual being, that there's a disconnect. And I'm not, by, by no means, I'm not trying to like diagnose you and dig into your own therapy session. I'm just kind of talking more in general terms yeah. about how challenging it really is when we, our first experiences or our early experiences are not that of our own. We don't get a chance to define our own sexual voice because someone else decided to, to, to do that. And you kind of have that loop. The more I think about that experience, the further I get away from my own sexual, um, you know, my own sexual desires with my husband. And I, the thing that you're experiencing is um, 
you know, it, I'm sorry that that is, that's occurring, but it is so, um, it's so common of trauma to rob us of future experiences because of those intrusive thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't make it easier to deal with, but we, we do start to look at ways of, you know, how are you triggered by these thoughts? What are things that we could do to quiet that noise, really, that, that, you know, past noise of you don't deserve this or you can't feel pleasure. When your body is the trauma center, it's hard. You can't close the door on it. Yeah. You know, yeah. you do have to acknowledge that it's there and then actually actively cope to be able to experience beyond that trauma. Yeah. You know, it was so good to have that conversation with you all because I had gone through um, something with my family the year before and I, I had to one day like I had to come to terms with why I hate the color yellow, and I used to be like, why do I hate the color yellow? And the more I thought about it in this last year, and if anybody see me, I I love colors, but I never wear yellow. And it was because that's the dress I was wearing when I was five years old and was molested. And I, I will never forget. So I kind of developed this aversion to a color. Mm -hmm. you know? And I'm like, if a color can trigger you, then what happens when you are in an intimate relationship, you know? And in the movement, we're just not good at talking about sex and erotica and sexuality. Like we talk about everything but this. Right. And in and, and, and these times, for those of us that have a partner and are not living alone right now, you know, it should be such an intimate time. But you still kind of social distance from sexuality. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, King, I'm wondering, too, um, you know, for a long time in our generation, it'd be a lot of brothers would be like, Oh yeah, I had sex when I was nine. Yeah, I had sex when I was 11. And then now we know, no, you were raped, you were sexually assaulted as a man. It was almost like a badge of honor, at least in my communities and you know, from my folks in the Bronx and stuff that would applaud like, yes, he had sex at 11 years old. And you're like, no, he didn't choose that. You know, do you encounter talking to a lot of brothers or those that identify as men with this? Do you see as a man, um, the, do, do men feel comfortable now saying or in conversations with you, do you talk about that? Do men ask you about that? Well, I was actually um, interviewed for a documentary uh, a couple years ago that should, that should be um, coming out soon. Um, I was molested when I was eight years old by my, well, eight, nine years old by my babysitter. Um, and I remember when she dropped me off, I told my friends, like, I saw her naked. And their first response was like, oh, that's crazy, right? But in like a good way, you know? And I have had more conversations, including all the men that were speaking in this, uh, in this documentary about their trauma and there was kind of like that that common thread that went through everybody's trauma of like you know maybe some older heads in the neighborhood knew and they were like this is what you got to do right to right in. or they knew and they just didn't say nothing or whatever the case being you know um i think and and I and I would like to return to your your point about the movement as well. But after I finish this, um, I think there is this this idea of manhood that really really needs to be addressed within our community, because the idea of manhood that is in our community now is what manhood is told to us from our oppressor and from our owner, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like it's really, and I always talk about this book. It's one of my favorite books ever. It's called um, All God's Children by Fox Butterfield. And in the book, he talks about um, like the history of violence in our community, like dating back not only to our time on the plantation and what we witnessed under the hands of our oppressor, but who those oppressors were. And, you know, like he was talking about in, in South, South Carolina, most of the overseers 
were Scottish and they were Highlanders and they were oppressed by the British and so on and such forth where they used to have the duels if somebody looked at you wrong. And that's where we did get the, you stepped on my sneakers or you looked at me funny, you've challenged my manhood now. That wasn't an African thing. That wasn't a Taino thing. That was a European thing that's been put on us. And we've also been told that because in order to be a good slave man for breeding, you have to be good at sex in the way of having sex, mm. not caring about your partner, not even paying attention to your own pleasure, but how many partners you can have. And then also like branching out from that as well is the idea of having no feelings. You know, black mm. men were not allowed to have feelings. You're not allowed to think about being molested or sexually assaulted or abused. Right. Or the people who are supposed to watch out for you that pushed you into a sexual sexual situation like Boosie was talking about doing to, to kids on his Instagram live last week. You know, like yeah. that that the people who are adults who think they're cool for pushing sex on children are are abusive. Okay. The, that's sexual assault. Mm -hmm. You know, so having that within our culture, like that's something we have to shed off of us. We have to decolonize how we view sex. And part of it is being able to look at ourselves and see the beauty within ourselves and the beauty within the ranges of, uh, of diverse uh, relationship styles and sexualities, but also decolonizing is getting rid of the negative uh, stereotypes and ideas of what black and brown sexuality is supposed to be. And that is, you know, something that is uh, entertaining and uh, pushed on by the oppressor. And I think that kind of going back to what you were saying about the movement, uh, I think that it pops up in the movement as well, because a lot of and this is dating back, you know, to, to the Black Power movement in the 50s, 60s, through the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s to right now is we're trying to redefine who we are. But it's the harder part. It's one thing to say, like, I shouldn't be, you know, beaten on. Right. I shouldn't be not allowed to walk into this store or, or you know, like those simple things. But. I think it's been harder for us to let go of what manhood is in our minds because we've had our manhood defined by people who have wanted to use and destroy us. So we hold on to that shit because oh, I'm going to be a man and being a man means, you know, I got to hurt people and, and put people down and step on their neck, not realizing that you are just becoming a clone of your oppressor. Yeah. Like the manhood that people are striving for is to be like, quote unquote, the man, you know? And that's why we're destroying ourselves and we won't be able to get out of this shit because we're just repeating another cycle. Like there's, you know, the the idea that black men have become the white men of our own community. Mm -hmm. We're always oppressing others and, put, and attacking women, beating up trans folk and killing uh, gay folk in our community. You know, we're taking on the role of oppressors in our own in our own communities instead of working through what's really the problem and what's going on with us. Yeah, can you can you repeat um, the title of the book again, Hassan, that you referenced? Uh, All God's Children by Fox Butterfield. Mm. So before um, I let you go, I have two questions. Is there a way to have safe sex right now? in in you know outside of your, your your home you know like if you're single do you put on a glove and kiss there's my husband justice well, there's a start Please, justice. <laughs> <laughs> somebody that you feel that you can trust 
to keep the same standard of safety, um, safety precautions, right? So I'm hearing about um, people saying that they're social social distancing or they're quarantining, but they're still having like these dates, you know, these low key like cr- creeping, like creeping has taken on a whole new <laughs> term, <laughs> COVID creeping. I, I'm doing <laughs> myself, but whatever. Y'all know what I mean. um, so really being, you know, in terms of safety. You know, not letting your 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 hormones get ahead of you. You know, just because someone says that they've been social distancing, really thinking about what exactly what do you mean by that? You know, does it mean you're going to your mom's house? Who's going to your mom's? And who else is going to your mom's right. house? Who, what, you know, so I think we do need to look at your, the the position before we're talking about contact tracing. I think we need to do a little bit of that when it comes to dating right now, or you know, seeing people intimately. Um, if you are coupled up. Uh, you know, thank goodness and count your blessings and do something with that coupleship. Um, it is always safe to fuck yourself. There you go. That's <laughs> true. That's true. That's, you know, um, that, yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and, I mean, if you do, if you do yeah. want to include somebody into your masturbation, you know, Skype, Zoom. Hey, Rosa. Hi. All that good stuff. <laughs> FaceTime, you know, there's, I think it's it's important to always be creative. And yeah. if you're unable to be there in, in the same physical space as your lover, you know, get creative. You could sex, you could send pictures, you could send video, y'all could do lives. You know, you could buy my dildo and use it on yourself, of course. Shameless plug. Um, no, but, shame. <laughs> no, no shame. No shame in the sex. No I, don't, shame, I, shame. I don't mind a, a sex toy like a dildo, but I will not buy yours. That was for your audience. That was for everybody else. That's everybody else. I want to find yours. Too much for me to know about Hassan now. No, I, I think that the, that that's one way. I mean, also, if you are in a place where you can get tested, I mean, add the COVID yeah. test to your STD test. That's what yeah. that's what's going to be ha- going to be happening in the in the porn industry. We're going to have to add the COVID right. test to the full panel of testing that we get. But, you know, it definitely there is there is a responsibility that we all have, whether even even not having sex. Right. Mm -hmm. There is the responsibility that we all have to make sure that we keep everyone around us healthy and safe as well, just as we want that for ourselves. So, you know, any of those decisions that you make, you know, just keep that in mind. I just want to talk really, really quickly about kind of like emotional safety around sex and, and hooking up at this time. Um, yeah. A lot of folks are bored, right? And and sometimes we make different decisions when we're <laughs> bored or desperate. <laughs> and I, think, you know, I see this happening. Like, I think it's important just to even be honest with with potential partners or your partner, even if it's your 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 partner partner. Like, I'm you know I'm bored. Like, let's let's just try some try something new, you know. Or I've been or I, I'm not really sure where I think this might go after quarantine, but you know, I, I'm great. I'm grateful to be able to spend some time with you during this time. You know, just being really honest with with yourself and other people. I think some people may be trying to create some serious bonds during this time mm-hmm. that they would not normally do with a particular person. So yeah. just make sure you're checking in with your own emotional safety and also you're setting realistic expectations for whoever it is that you might be linking up with during this time. Cause it is a stressful time yeah. and we make different, you know, decisions during stressful periods. So just want to keep that in mind too. But sex is a great stress reliever. It is. It is. That is very true. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I didn't mention at the beginning, you are based in Tampa, Florida. So quickly, what is Florida looking like? Are y'all worried? Or you're like, it's a, is it a shit show down there right now? With everybody? Yeah, I mean, because it is a shit show. <laughs> we, 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 you know, we've been we've been keeping it in um, mm-hmm. isolation. Um, you know, right before everything was in full lockdown, you know, we stocked up on the important stuff: toilet paper and bullets. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, bullets but, the guns. Yeah. but I think um. You know, what we've heard and what we've been reading, you know, especially in regards to, you know, how they're keeping statistics down here has mm-hmm. been the, the real, uh, the real disturbing part where, yeah. you know, if somebody 
you know, a lot of people travel to Florida or live in Florida part like off and on through the year, mm -hmm. snowbirds, we call them. You know, if you have an ID and you passed away and in Florida and your ID said Jersey, for example, you know, they're not counting you as a Florida case. Oh, but somehow, even with that, we're still in uh, the ninth state as of today in terms of number of cases. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's enough for us to just kind of like chill. If, if, if people want to move forward with these haphazard um, or lack of rules, you know, allow them to move forward. But for our family and our circle, we are keeping it in. And, and keeping it very insulated. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I realized I don't think I I wouldn't think that that is a way that they can hide the numbers like that. Yeah, I mean, well, if there's a way to lie, they're gonna lie. Yeah, mm -hmm. DeSantis wants to wants to please his uh, his master. So, hmm. well, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? One good thing that came out of uh, Florida today, policy wise, is that. A federal judge said that um, last year, I think it was, maybe it's been two years, where people who were incarcerated yeah. um, finally got their um, right to vote back after years of people campaigning. And today a federal judge said that the fines that DeSantis and the Republican wanted these formerly incarcerated people to pay was equal to the poll tax to keep all these 450,000 people that got their right back to vote, mostly black and brown people, and struck that down. You know, so hopefully uh, homie goes in November when all, hopefully all of them in the next year. Yeah, I mean, it was very interesting because DeSantis tried to use, he was running saying like, yeah, yeah, we want to get this right to try and pull votes. Right. And as soon as they got in, they tried to manipulate how it was gonna be instituted, so. You know, yeah. that was a very good ruling. Yeah, so I'm glad that happened. Give out your information so folks can follow you. And of course, I'm bringing you back. Um, in fact, anyone that has questions, send them so we could bring um, Keen and, and Jasmine back. So give out your information so folks know where to reach you. If you're interested in learning more about therapy services, you can find us at blueprotherapy.org and Blue Pearl Therapy on all social media. And uh, my personal pages are, well, my personal pages, <laughs> other pages, uh, Jet Setting Jasmine and JetSettingJasmine.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at The Real King Noir, that's K I N G N O I R E, on Twitter at King Noir. And of course, you can find us both on Royal Fetish XXX.com and, you know, Pornhub, X Videos, all those other places that people are searching, OnlyFans, we there. Well, Thank you so much for coming. I'm I'm just glad to see you that you're safe, the family's safe, and um, I think I'm gonna get a lot of questions, and I hope I do. You know, I told one per a couple people I was doing this, and one person was like, "Why?" And I was like, "Cause we're grown ass people, and we need to talk about like we cannot keep repeating these patterns of especially, really especially for women, women of color who are." have been shamed their entire lives um, by your family, your religion, or whatever. Um, if, if our children are modeling gender fluid fluid um, ways of, of being, then we have to kind of step up and stop being embarrassed about what is pleasure and that it is stress relieving and all of that. Like, sex is good for a lot of things. You know, lying is for a lot of things. So I just thank y'all so much. I love you, fam. Stay safe. I'm bringing you back on. All right. Okay. All right. Love y'all. Stay safe. You too. Peace. All right. So, hey, everybody. I hope that everybody learned a lot, not only from um, Joaquin, but also from Jasmine and, and uh, Keen. I'm, I'm glad they were all three together on um, as a lot of things um, intersect in all three of the work and, and what they're doing. But we wanna to end today's um, show with showing you uh, three books. We're gonna do that every show, two or three books. Um, but first we wanna talk about a current situation with, oh, let me put that up. Let's do the books first. Okay, so, oh, wait a minute. 
see, there's Jalil Munti Kins. I Jalil has written two books. Jalil Munti Kane on the Black Liberation Army. And then this is Jalil Muntakin. We are our own liberators. Um, and the reason we want to talk about Jalil is because he is a political prisoner that has been incarcerated for almost 47 years. And currently, right now, he has been transported from Sul uh, Sullivan, uh, Sullivan County Community Jail. Um, here in upstate New York. He's been brought to Albany Medical Center here in Albany where I'm at, uh, where I live, um, because he has COVID. And I just wanna read what the call is um, so that we can get Jalil out immediately. He deserves complete, he should have been released years ago. He's supposed to be up for parole. This will be his 10th time. Um, and now, unfortunately, he has contracted COVID. So I just want to read this and please go to the Jericho Movement.com or .org, the Jericho Movement. And also, um, uh, Jalil has a blog and he is also on Twitter. So please follow Jalil on Twitter and Facebook. Please um, go see the work the Jericho Movement is doing, as well the work that RAP is doing, which is releasing aging prison population. But right now, our eyes and our energy needs to be turned on to Jalil at this very moment. Jalil Muntikin, who has been incarcerated 49 years in New York State prisons on a 25-year minimum sentence, became ill last week tested positive for COVID-19 and has been hospitalized in Albany. Mr. Muntakim is a widely respected elder and former member of the Black Panther Party. Jalil has served approximately 50 years, half a century in prison. He has an exemplary prison record, has expressed sincere remorse for his actions, and by every available measure poses the lowest possible risk of committing another offense if released. But New York Attorney General Letitia James, who many progressives voted for, who is an African-American woman, appealed the judge's decision that prevented Jalil from being released while he waits for his appeal to be heard. During this time, despite his concerted efforts to protect himself with the meager means available behind bars, Jalil contracted the virus and is now fighting for his life. The United States has the highest number of corona-related deaths in the world. New York State is the epicenter with the highest number of cases and mortalities within that jails and prisons under New York State's Department of Corrections and Community Supervision are the epicenters within the epicenter. There are already 490 492 confirmed cases amongst incarcerated people and over 1,200 amongst staff in state prisons. And these numbers do not reflect what's happening in juvenile detention centers, immigrant detention centers, or Rikers Island. Um, straight up, it's our duty to get Jalil home. And people, please write him. You can write him. Go to Jericho Movement go to rap, donate money. You have to think, I'm not even 50 years old. Jalil has been in prison for 50 years. A lot of his comrades have come out um, and there's something that they just don't wanna release Jalil, but the people will make sure that Jalil is released. So whatever your way of sending vibes, health, energy, send them to Jalil right now, write him, join the movement that's going to work to make sure that he comes out. Um, a lot of Black and Puerto Rican and some white legislators have already written a letter to um, the Attorney General and to Andrew Cuomo. Also understand that Andrew Cuomo has done, he has released almost nobody. Um, but there's been two people that have been released, Paul Manafort and Michael Cohen. So part of Trump's criminal syndicate gang 
have both two of them have been released because of fear of them getting COVID-19 and dying. So it is totally our duty right now to get our 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 one of the greatest revolutionaries and liberators of our lifetime out. You know, so I hope again, um, and also order Jalil's book, read, um, and, and and know that behind the walls, Jalil has been part of every movement, whether he's taught about them, whether he writes us to tell us what we're doing wrong and what we need to be doing right. His work behind the walls is more work than some of us have done. And, and he's done so much and we cannot let him die. We cannot let him die, okay? So please, everybody, go to Jericho, tweet Jalil, follow rap, and stay tuned um, for more information. And you know what? If progressives and Democrats and black and brown people voted Letitia James in as a state attorney general, she needs to be very aware that we can vote her out. And we need to make that real. And I'll end with these two books today. And I thank you. Um, you know, I said sometimes the show will be short, sometimes it'll be long, depending on the discussions. And always this will be uploaded for people who couldn't watch the whole thing. I know it's a long time we took today. So much is happening, and I'm just grateful. Um for Tandi, my executive producer, and everybody who's been watching. And, you know, we'll continue to deal with technical difficulties. Um, and if anybody wants to sponsor us, hit me up at Clemente Rose at Gmail. And I don't want to forget our current sponsors, which is Youth of X, a film program, um, a youth organization based here in Albany, V Day to End Violence Against All. Um, women and girls. V-Day is founded by Eve Ensler and um, the Museum of Contemporary African Diasporic Arts, Mokata, based in Brooklyn. Those are our sponsors and I'm so grateful for you all um, sponsoring us and we will continue to bring you um, not only voices that should be seen and heard, but issues that need to be um, interrogated and as well to always highlight the resistance and not just the oppression of our people. Um, yesterday was a virtual launch of one of our comrades, Dr. Jared Ball's new book, The Myth and Propaganda of Buying Power, right? Pick it up. Everything we always thought um, and have been taught about black capitalism will save us. Um, and we've been in these movements so long that everybody's like, well, if we boycott or the GDP and how much money black people make, um, not only does Jared really uh, interrogate that in this book, he interrogates capitalism as an utter failure and having billionaires itself shows a failure of a system. And because we have Joaquin on, I wanted to share this new book I got called Deadliest Enemy or War Against Killer Germs, you know? So we will be back tomorrow. And tomorrow is going to be all about Puerto Rico. We're going to have the mayor of San Juan, Carmen Yulín Cruz, and also Dr. Maita Moreno Vega, a mentor to so many of us who now lives in Luisa, Puerto Rico, and as always has started a new initiative. And so everybody tomorrow, well, the two women tomorrow will both be from Puerto Rico. So please join us. And thank you so much for supporting us. Share this. We'll um, keep getting better at it, get more technical help and stuff like that. Um, I just wanted to really thank everybody for their time. I think these guests were great. And if you have any questions for the guests, we will forward them. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Stay up, stay safe, stay healthy. See you in the whirlwind. Thanks, everybody.